Kia ora koto. Welcome to HR Chats with me, to Radar, where we chat all things HR. Today, before I welcome our guests, it's probably appropriate that they welcome all of us. Kia ora hemi. A tēnā tātou katoa. Tēnei wai e mihi atu ki a koutou i te ata nei, nā reira. He karakia mo te timatanga mo tātou hui. I o ngā mano, tēnei te whakamui me te atu ki a koe mo tēnei huhuinga. Ara hina mai ki a u ki te tika ki te pono. Tukoa mai tō wairoa hei manaki hei te aki mo mātou. Tēnei mātou tūa hūnei e mō tō aro aro, runga te ngō mātou kai whakora. Āmeni. Many uh, kia ora, Hemi. Hemi Hita, they're welcoming us. He is from a little place called Mohaka. Some of you may be familiar with it. Beautiful little part of the world, 25 kilometers south of Wairoa. What a great town over there on the East Coast. He has worked in several settings, including the Department of Corrections. He's worked with Iwi. He's worked up in the Northern Territories uh, with Primary Mental Health, and he's currently the Health and Wellbeing Manager for Te Ahu Ataranga with uh, Heb Construction. Also a registered psychologist. And his interests include sports, music, socializing, art, watching TV, collecting figurines. We might get on to that later on, fishing and hanging with his granddaughter. Now, we normally don't mention all of people's interests, but I think today it's particularly important. And sitting next to him, someone whose interests include uh, refereeing first class rugby. He was the winner of a local hero medal in 2011, loves to give back to his community. Uh, he's a dedicated dad and husband, and also working with Heap Construction on the Te Hau Aturanga Manawatu Tararua Highway Alliance. If you're not familiar with that project, replacing the gorge, a scholar, bachelor in management and coaching, a graduate diploma in management, a master's in business, and a doctor in business leadership. How does he find the time, Dr. Mark Long? Good morning, gentlemen. Good enough. Thank you. It's Thank a lot. You. There's a lot going on. Tell us today. We're talking about fanoingatanga. Shall we have a definition of what that means before we sort of get into it? According to kind of to both of you, because there may be some people who, who've certainly heard the term but may not be overly familiar with what exactly it means and certainly what it means in the context of your current employment. The the beauty we we had this called it all back at the start of the project about how do we describe our values and we came back very quickly to we want uh, we want to be on Maori values because for me my definition can and should always be different to someone else's because that's a way for us to connect and that's a way for us to find similarities and differences and within both of them there's beauty so Fanaungatanga for me means that I come into a space and I feel as though I'm present I feel as though I'm welcome and I feel as though I'm around my brothers and sisters where I can drop my where I can drop my shield and I can be who I am and who I want to be. Yeah, and, and, um, and the same is for me, you know, it's really that sense of being a part of, of something more than, than work people, than just uh, work colleague who comes in, you know, does their eight hours and leaves. It's actually being, having aunties, having uncles, having brothers, having sisters that are there side by side with sharing the same experiences, being a bit different from time to time, but regardless, we all have the same kind of the cope up of the same purpose and what we're trying to achieve. In a way, it's, it's sort of, I guess, we've been having a conversation around this in HR and the, in the podcast about that sense of being able to bring your whole self to work, essentially, but but more yeah. than that. Yeah, yeah, and, and it is more than, um, so when, we, you know, the way that I see whanaungatanga and Fano really is um, we can have an individual come into work and, um, you know, we, we go through simple processes like as soon as, a new person comes onto our site, they're acknowledged at the door. Um, you know, with the COVID, we might give them the elbow, but you know, we'd give them a hungi. Um, we'd invite them in. We, we really monarchy them, so it's really support them, respect them, treat them with dignity. And then from that point on, or once their, their kind of induction for Nangatunga process is finished, they are truly a part of our fano. And so we have people walking into our office on a day to day basis going, Hey, Barry, how are you doing? But really having those conversations to discuss how they've been doing, but also around how their whānau at home are doing, because as soon as they come in and be a part of their whānau, so do their whānau at home. Many of us were probably brought up uh, with the saying, leave your personal life at the door before you come into mahi. And what, what we, I personally don't believe that's possible, let alone realistic to expect anyone else, anyone else to do. Um, so we put a range of measures in place to understand what's currently going on for people because there's always something going on. So when our people come onto site across the 12, the 12 kilometre alignment, we ask them their fotaha of wellbeing, their tahatinana, 
um, their physical well-being, their taha wairua, their spiritual well-being, their taha hiningaru, their psychological well-being, their taha whānau, or their family and social connectedness. And we ask our people to rate themselves on a scale of 0 to 10. If they tell us that they are between 0 and 3, Hemi and our, uh, and our well-being team will contact them within a couple of hours to find out what's actually going wrong. And our whānau order supports are in place and ready to be stood up in real time for our people to be supported. We keep an eye on people with between four and seven, and we provide support within 24 hours or as, as needed. And anyone else in our top in our um, upper range of seven to 10, we keep an eye on them. And if someone's consistently nine and they go to an eight, we're gonna check in with them because that could be a significant shift for them. We want to understand what's going on because once we do, we can enable our people to be better. Our program is better. Our whānau connectedness is better. We do stuff faster, we do it safer, and we're all better for it. Now tell me, for people listening to this and they're, and they're maybe unfamiliar with the sort of the notion of these large alliances of, of, of business. So you you guys are with with Heb Construction, and that's part of that larger alliance that's putting this 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 passage this road through. Can you talk a little bit about how that works? How how, for example, I guess you know where your role fits into it, where Heb's role fits into it, what comes from there, and then that larger discussion. I guess, with all of the alliance partners as to how this works? So uh, alliancing is fundamentally about getting the best out of all of your partnerships and all of your partners. So our, our alliance is made up of Wakakutahi, New Zealand Transport Agency. Uh, we've got Heb Construction and Fulton Hogan as our two major construction partners. And we've got Oricon and WSP as our two major uh, planning and consenting partners. What we've done for the first time of a major project is we have brought each of our five iwi to the table at a governance leadership and management perspective throughout our alliance. And what's that, what that's done is allowed us to have a smart start. It's allowed us to actually do the right thing, which is having mana whenua and tangata whenua at the table, uh, informing us and providing us opportunities to, to be better. And a lot of our initiatives have come from that partnership. Uh, what it also does is, is it allows Fulton Hogan of 7,000 people, uh, WSP of tens of thousands, Oricon of thousands, Heb of 2,000, um, our iwi partners of tens of thousands, to bring all of the best of who they are. So we are working with the best training and development people, the best HR practitioners, um, the best constructors, the best designers, and we are able to pull upon all of the best of these really large nationally respected organizations. And it's, it's the way of the future. It allows us to think differently through partnership rather than going it alone. Give me what's been the most difficult part of this. Is it, is it the the overarching thing or is it getting the buy-in from people who are who are working on the site to actually fill in these forms and accept a little bit of i, I guess it's not intrusion it's it's care isn't it i i guess well uh, i don't know if i'd say it's difficult i suppose that if we look at it in terms of you know opportunities previously the construction industry didn't have a lot of opportunities to explore what health looked like or health and well-being you know um yes we had um health and health and safety coaches and managers and things like that. But unfortunately, health would fall away because it was really around the safety aspects and the rules, the policies, the procedures, et cetera, et cetera. What we've been able to achieve here is to actually put health at the forefront of people's minds, but get them to actually challenge their own thoughts around that and get them to explore how they can enhance not only their own well-being, the well-being of their team and therefore um, ultimately the well-being of the of the project. So like anything new, it's always gonna it's always gonna grow, you know, there's gonna be teething problems and things like that. And we've had those, but um, they're, they're all opportunities for learning. So it's you know it's a, it's a, it's a different way of exploring things. Yes, it must be a like a, a great opportunity because as you say, you know, construction used to be people would come in their individual things they would they would work on contracts often relatively short term and then they would they would go away again but this this project you know you've got thousands of people there invested in it it's, it's their community and we were talking about those kind of community interests earlier on with the, with sport and various other bits and pieces how important is all of that bringing all of that into a project like this and, and recognizing that it's it's more than simply those eight hours in the workplace i think it's quite significant and um i suppose you know, from the start, what we really emphasise is, yes, the, the, the completion of the road is what, what we're here to do, and that's a, that's a goal, but the major goal ultimately is for our whānau to go home at the end of the day, happy, healthy and well. 
if we use that as the context, then everything else can be built around that. And ultimately the road will be built because people are operating in a space where they feel supported, they feel as though they're cared for. There's lots of nurturing, there's lots of coaching, there's lots of support, and you know, it, it starts to take care of itself. Um, and I'll, you know, to give you an example, here in the workspace, um, for we've been, I suppose, oper you know, doing a lot of operational work for the last 10 months, nearly 11 months now. And um, speaking with our, our safety and risk manager, we haven't had any major um, you know, incidents. Um, and that's unheard of for a project that's been operating so long and for such a large scale. And so, you know, they, it's all those little things, those sense of whānau, sense of belonging, nurturing, um, you know, and a lot of adherence to the values that we have that really, keep, that really drives that. I'm wondering if you, if, if you get that then because you have created an, an environment where people can speak up and say, hey, uh, I don't reckon you should do that or I don't think that's a very good idea. Yeah, well, that, that's one of our key anchors. So, um, you know, we, again, during our kind of, well, I suppose the best term to, to use is the induction, we call it whanaungatanga. During the, the very first whanaungatanga session that we have with everybody, we, have three, we, we talk about three key anchors, which is show up, team up and speak up. And we get people to experience or to engage in the activities that allow those to be facilitated, both in the space and then out on the worksite, because it is empowering them. But we also use the adage of, if you were at home and a situation occurred, would you wait for, and I'll use the example, would you wait for a safety officer to come along and say, oh, actually, you can only do this. You know, so it's actually extending the people's, you know, people's experience from the workspace to bringing in their home experiences to say this is what we want to generate in the workspace. That's how we'll achieve better well-being, better safety and better health for all our people. Mark, how big of a sort of a step change is this from, from your experience? You've got a lot of experience in this. You know, is it is it very different or is it a sort of a logical progression from what's been happening for a little while? It's 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 principally focused. So so I, I want I want to put out there to people who are watching this that it's it's first a change in the minds of those who are influential and who want to make a change to then allow others to come on the journey and experience it from their individual perspectives. And the way I like to look at it is so often we say I'm presenting to the board, I'm presenting to the senior leadership team, I'm presenting to our earthworks operators, I'm presenting to uh, cigar drivers, uh, truck drivers, cigar operators. Whereas in fact we we dehumanise these groups that are made up of human beings. And when I reflect on our board and my experience with our board and my experience with our senior leadership team, I was presenting to human beings. And these are human beings who have had a range of different experiences and trials and tribulations with culture, with knowing absolutely what kind of manager they do not want, with kind of understanding what kind of manager they and leader they want to be in the future, and, and taking people back to what is the right thing to do. Partnership is the right thing to do. Social outcomes are the right thing to do. Having people happy, healthy, and well is the right thing to do. But how do we operationalize and realize what we inherently feel is the right thing to do into something where people are able to experience that on a daily basis, right? So I was the, the journey that I took was what do we actually want to achieve, achieve here and what do I want to see and what do I want to feel? Because once we can allow our senior leaders to feel something, they are on board because their feeling will be taken to someone else and this effect where people continue to uh, influence each other and, and long for that feeling of appreciation, of acceptance, of belonging, then that's where we create our, our culture. And one of our key principles within that has been appreciative inquiry. Appreciative inquiry is a formalized uh, change and organizational development tool, but we've taken artistic license, I suppose, and we've turned it into a philosophical approach, I guess, whereby we look, we look for the good that's continuing to happen. And within our Whanaungatanga process during the speak up state, we give people lived experiences. So we've got different scenarios. And one of my favorites is we've got um, basically a person who's metaphorically a meter and a half above the ground with no edge protection, no harness on. And, and, and we, our question is walk past, what do you do? If that's your brother or sister, walk past, what do you do? We have the range of people walking past saying, oh no, that looks cool. We have other people walking past and kind of being shocked and I don't know what that should look like, so I'm gonna to continue to walk past. And there was this, um, was he, he was Samoan. Samoan, yeah, Samoan. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was Samoan. 
It was one of our first Fenomatanga, and I get goosebumps thinking about it. He walks past, he hadn't said much for the, for the first, I guess, hour and a half of the Fenomatanga process. And he walked past and he looked up and he said, brother, I don't want to go home and tell your whanau that you've been hurt or, or seriously hurt or killed as a result of that fall. Can you come down here and can we have a quarter door about it? And there was silence. I, I recall it was about three minutes. It must have been only 30 seconds. There was silence. And everyone felt that. And we take people back to what is the intention of your words? His intention was to get that person down and protect them. So often we have people walk past and say, oh, you're being an idiot, or don't be an egg, and come and, and just don't kind of sort your life out, right? The intention of that is not to protect someone. The intention of that is to protect yourself because, because you don't know how to effectively engage. We take people over that threshold of what should I be doing towards what have I done about that situation? And we take it one step further. It's easier to see what's going wrong. Uh, it's harder to see and act upon what's going right. And what's going right is 99.9% .9 of the time, right? So we allow people to have a lived experience by walking past that same scenario where someone is a metre and a half above the ground wearing a, a harness, got edge protection, and we invite them to walk past. What do you do? Again, some people walk past and say nothing. Other people walk past and kind of give a, a, a nod of acknowledgement. Other people walk past and stop and say, I really appreciate you for prioritizing your safety. I trust what you're doing and it looks really good. Like keep it up, that's awesome. If we continue to fill up, fill up people's finite buckets with positivity and what they're doing well, the other stuff will overflow out. But if we fill it up with the negativity, the other stuff will flow out. So our conscious choice every morning and every day is what are we gonna fill up our bucket with and how, do we, how are we gonna fill up other people's buckets with positivity and all of the goodness that they're doing. Fantastic. Hey, look, does these opportunities to, to work on such a scale, I suppose, don't come along all that often. Do you, do you look at this in a way as being able to, to see these values and, and these practices into businesses that, that, that these contractors, a lot of them, you know, will then go back to different communities, to different businesses, and they'll take that with them? How important is that, that you have the ability within this framework to create something really lasting so that's that's been part of our focus uh, our focus has always been we must do this right for our people and we must also do it right because our people will take it with them to other organizations and Aotearoa New Zealand will be better as a result of our impact here so we will impact between five and six thousand people who come on to work for this project over the next three and a half years uh, including the thousand that we've uh, already impacted the 1,500 that we've already influenced and impacted. Uh, but that, that was a secondary outcome. Our major outcome was giving our people a better experience. But you're absolutely right. The construction sector is looking at this. We've now got Mates in Construction, a suicide prevention organisation, because we've got some of the worst mental health rates and some of the highest suicide rates in our, in our sector. And why is that? I believe it's because we're talking to operators rather than human beings. And we're talking about programme and outcomes rather than human factors. And so often we've prioritized program and cost over everything else. Whereas in fact, to us, program and cost are an outcome of effective human decisions and behaviors. So once we, once we fundamentally shift our focus away from program and cost towards effective human behaviors, we allow ourselves to think about things totally differently. We allow our people to think about opportunities and open themselves up to what can be rather than problems where they're closed off, thinking about a very small, issue or aspect of something that's much larger. Uh, and that's the opportunity that humans have. Yeah. Himi, you're a registered psychologist. How much of what you're doing now did you study while you were in academia? <laughs> you know, uh, has, has it, have, have we moved substantially? Was there, was there fringes of it there? Was it there, but couched in a different kind of language? Do you know yeah, what I mean? I Definitely. I mean, throughout, throughout most academic kind of, you know, areas that you'll find all aspects of this, the true learnings and the true experiences really came from the marae-based um, lifestyle that I had and the other people, you know, in my, in my whānau here experienced. When we talk about going to marae, we're talking about manaakitanga, you know, the, the uplifting of mana or supporting people, treating them with decency and respect. I mean, that's a fundamental human value that we all hold. We just demonstrate it in different ways. So, um, you know, when we do it here at, at, at Mahi, 
um, we're able to do that freely and openly without needing to engage in a porphyry process. Um, so it's, you know, it's the, there are aspects that sit, like I said, right across the academic world, but really the experiences we took from the marae. Every, all the lens is quite funny. You go to you go to university to learn all the theories and to, you know the um, the outcomes that you should be achieving. But we've got experiences, and we all have this in our own lives around how we can achieve that. And it takes us right back to the basics. What are the biggest mistakes you think people can make that that you, that you've seen in terms of implementing something like this? There's there's only one for me, and that's not believing in it. So to all of our all of our people and HR practitioners or people who love that kind of stuff, you don't necessarily have to be a practitioner. Believe in it, feel it, and share it with other people. And importantly, do not feel as though you own it. For us, we we have not owned our outcomes. Our people and our whānau own their own outcomes. What we are here to do is to make them better, to get them there faster to get them uh, more connected with what other people are doing so they can support and gain support. If you fundamentally believe in what you're doing, and if you can articulate that in a way to other people through understanding what they want to achieve and aligning that with what you want to achieve, you will be successful. Intent will lead us to have this across the country. It's a shift away from owning an outcome to supporting whānau to achieve an outcome. That's a fundamental difference. So I, you know, in, in the health and wellbeing space, and especially this was a lesson that I, you know, took on was I would try to own all the health and you know psychological outcomes for our people. It wasn't sustainable. I mean, one person for you know ultimately is going to be three hundred and fifty. Or you'd have to cut me up into hundreds of pieces. Whereas if we support Fano to enhance their own wellbeing, whatever that may look like and however they achieve that, that is sustainable because you empower them to do all the everything that they need. And what you do is you start to tag in where they need it. That is the, you know, that, that's been the difference. Yeah. How does all of this fit in the, into the larger, almost a metaphorical concept of the project itself? Reconnecting communities, creating a, uh, a, a line down which people can travel freely backwards and forwards with a great deal of ease. Because for people unfamiliar with it, you know, the, the loss of that road through the gorge was it's hugely impacting. Um, I mean, it's led to a beautiful drive over the hills, but not everyone wants that. <laughs> what, what does it mean in a broader context was in, a, in, in that sense of community? Because I, I, I deliberately mentioned at the start all of those other sort of community things that you're all involved with, with sport and family and various bits and pieces. What does it mean on, a, on that kind of level, the community level? It's very personal. Uh, it's very personal, particularly to our whānau on the Tazawa side of the ranges. Uh, some of our people over there do not want to travel to Saddle Road or the to a track because it's too dangerous for them. So they have not connected with their whānau on, in the Manawatu or on the Manawatu side of the ranges for, for quite some time. We have had deaths on the Saddle Road and that's really front of mind for us. That's continuing to drive us to make sure that our human decisions and behaviours are affecting positive programme outcomes and we're able to deliver on time for people. But we had our leadership team meeting over there a couple of weeks ago, and we met with the Tazawa District Council's mayor and her senior leadership team. And hearing the stories from them and from their people, it's very personal. It's emotively personal. This connector, it's not a road to them, it's a connector for people and for places. And our vision reflects that. Our vision is reconnecting people and places past, present and future. Our mission is when the road comes in to uh, provide a safe, affordable and resilient highway, uh, to reconnect east to west. And then our values and our principles come from out of that. So we, we engage very strongly with our community to understand what this means to them. And our tagline is more than a road. It's a pretty good tagline. Hey, Emmy, um, you've said in your, in your bio notes, your dreams and goals for the future is to have a community that no longer requires your services. Yes. Because the community will be healthier, safer, and you can spend your time fishing and relaxing by the water. How close are you to that? <laughs> Well, I wish I was a lot closer than that. But, um, you know, the, to hand on heart, I can honestly say that this project is, is probably about, um, you know, a, a quarter of the way there to achieving their goal. We've got, we've, you know, we've, we now have around 200 and odd people on site every day that actually have their own health and well-being front of mind every day. Whether it's just a quick... 30 second advance or it's actually a, a, a three minute consideration. The fact is, is that people are doing their own self checks. You know, whether it's psychologically, 
physically, spiritually, or you know, socially, it doesn't matter. It's there. And that's all we wanted to do was to plant the seed and to, you know, to support the growth, the nurturing of that. So we're getting there, you know. I'm hopeful. <laughs> I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Hey, you know, Mark, this is your community. You you grew up there. You've you've received from a young age, you know, awards for you know Kiwi Bank awards and stuff for working in the community. What does this What does this mean to you when you look at the at the bigger picture of it all? It's legacy, right? And, and it's legacy in so many ways. It's a legacy for the environment because this project will give a net gain to the environment. There's 1.8 million to 2 million additional native trees that are being planted around Kirohi, around the region. Uh, our people are finally going to be better as a result. Uh, finally, that might be unfair. Our people are going to be better as a result of being involved in this project. We have major training and development initiatives up and going. We have major opportunities for Māori and Pacifica Fano around the region to get involved. We have major opportunities to reconnect uh, mana whenua with what has traditionally been privately held land uh, to come up here and, and work on this and to provide a, a different connection for people. And ultimately, the goal for all of us is local people with local stories building a local piece of infrastructure for local people to enjoy. Right? And the shared use path, path along the, the whole 11 and a half, 12 kilometres of the alignment, going through an active wind farm, it's genuinely majestic to be up there to work on. And we cannot wait to share that with people who will drive there daily, weekly, monthly, or for the yearly trip to nature. Significant point to mention as well is that, um, you know, the project, um, will, you know, the goal is to leave a legacy, a positive legacy for the community, to have whānau that live here that, are, that have been upskilled as a result of being involved, whether that's in the construction industry, whether that's business, whether that's just pure knowledge of, you know, how things are done, you know, that's a, that's a significant part that this project will, you know, will impart upon the community. So, yeah. It's pretty awesome. Hey, look, you guys have got a lot of knowledge in this thing. You're experiencing it. If you could leave a little, little single nugget of wisdom or something that you do that helps you get through the day or that you really focus on, got it. What's, what's your, top, your top tip for someone in HR? We'll start with uh, Mark. My top tip uh, from my experience is get alongside your leader. As much as, as much as we think we own culture and people and HR and, and people outcomes, ultimately we are here to enhance the outcomes that our, that our CEO or that our, that our board and our senior leadership team aspire to, to achieve. What we then do is we navigate people towards that. And so often I believe as practitioners and experts, we're expected to know the right answer. And if we could all be recategorized as chief people officers to give, to allow time for reflection, to allow time for insight, and for allow, to allow people and our leadership to get a deeper perspective and understanding of what they're actually here to achieve and to challenge and to totoko and to support what they're trying to achieve and be realistic that our leaders don't necessarily know what leadership are. Bet your bottom dollar they know what poor leadership looks like because they would have experienced it. But we must walk alongside our senior leaders as human beings to realise their goals and aspirations first so they will own the, uh, the or be, be responsible for the goals and aspirations of their teams to be realised. Brilliant. Hear me. Yeah, for me, it's around um, ensuring that we always have people or whānau at the centre of all decisions. We start with that as our, as our main goal. Then everything that we support or build around them will be for the benefit of them. Um, and, you know, that's the, I suppose here at Te Hua Tūranga, that's what we've been, you know, we use the whānau water model. We look at what whānau's goals, dreams, aspirations and desires are, and we support them to achieve that. You can do that in the HR space, that's, you're, you're winning. You know, yes, rules, regulations, processes and procedures are important, but we've all broken a rule and yet we hold them in such high regard. You know, it's really the people that we should be focusing on and how they feel, how they think and what they experience because if, if that's at the centre of our decisions, we're making the right decision from the start. Brilliant. Thank you, gentlemen. Hemi Heta and next to him, Dr. Mark Long. Both of them currently working with Heb Construction as part of the Te Ahu Aturanga. Uh, Manawatu Tararu, a Highway Alliance, and I challenge any of you after listening to this, the next time you drive along a road, well, for those of you who are 
who are not in lockdown that it, you have a think what what is what does it mean what is the what is the metaphor of that long stretch of tar seal uh when it comes to building better communities and building better people and i know i very much look forward to having a very good think about that when this road is eventually finished when's it going to be finished i guess it, <laughs> off the record when's it going to be finished 16th <laughs> december 4 p.m 2024 Great. That's the kind of that is the kind of commitment and dedication to a target that I like from the Manawatu. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, another excellent conversation here on HR Chats with me, Tereda Huhe. Just what a great privilege it is to be having these HR chats with professionals out there making a better world. If there is anyone that you think we should talk to or any topic you would like us to consider, have a chat to Tina and the team at HRNZ. And if this is the first of the HR chats that you have come to, feel free to go back and have a look and a listen to all of the others. From me, for now, that's it. Goodbye.